coming to you pre-recorded from Colorado State University. Welcome to another episode of the Ag Next podcast. We are excited to be here today. Um, I'm Jen Rieskamp. Most people call me JR. I'm the head of strategy here at Ag Next. And my co-host is... I'm Pedro Carvalho. I'm an assistant professor here uh, at Ag Next. Exactly. Thank you for doing that amazing introduction. And we are visiting with Dr. Nate DeLay today. Nate is a agriculture economist, agricultural economist um, in Ag Next and also in DARE. So welcome, Nate. Excited to Thank have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. yeah. And Pedro's got our first question. So, Nate, we, we, I think we always start with these questions is asking people how, for you to start talking about your background and how growing up in agriculture or not background influenced you to go to this uh, job that you have today. Can you just start like where you grew up? Yeah. And things like that? Yeah. I, I have a sort of an unconventional path to working in, a, in an ag college. Uh, I actually grew up in the Denver metro area mm -hmm. uh, in a town called Littleton, which is just this uh, suburb of South Denver. And um, I went to college at a little liberal arts college in Billings, Montana called Rocky Mountain College, mm -hmm. oh, cool. which is a very small school. It's less than a thousand students. So um, very much in the kind of liberal arts tradition. And I studied business there. Uh, and while I was there, I had... I, they only had one economics professor mm -hmm. who taught all the econ courses, and he was he was actually an old rancher oh, okay. funny. who lived um, near Billings and, and had a cow-calf operation, and part of why he worked at that school was so he could be close to his ranch. Um, and, and he'd done an ag econ PhD, I think, at Oklahoma State and, and had been a tenure-track professor at um, North Dakota State. So mm -hmm. he had done the land-grant thing and then found his way back to be close to home and um he had a big influence on me so he kind of got me interested in economics and and i think planted the seed a little bit with ag econ uh, -huh. uh and so um i after graduating with a business degree this was uh spring of 2009 uh -huh. so if you remember back <laughs> that far uh there was the financial crisis in the fall of 2008 mm, yes so it was a pretty bad time to be coming out of school with a a generic business management degree. So anyway, um, I definitely graduated in 2008 too <laughs> with undergrad. Yep. Yeah. It was tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was rough. It was so, uh, it was, it was kind of a opportune time to go back to grad school. Same thing over here. <laughs> <laughs> but so what, what, why, uh, business school up first? Like, did you have any experience? Like any idea? I know that you're going to get to the egg part, but, uh, why business before that? Like you always like to follow think, the market or something? I or? think I was more interested in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and I, I think I had in mind that I'd um, be a small business owner or something like that mm -hmm. eventually. Um, so I've always been kind of fascinated with, with entrepreneurial people mm -hmm. and that's probably why I've gravitated towards production economics and thinking about how producers and managers make mm -hmm. decisions. Um, but I found early on that I was, I was probably not, um, I'm probably not built to be a business owner myself, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. rather, um, I really enjoy studying and, and understanding the decisions that producers and decision, uh, business owners make. So economics was kind of the perfect fit because, um, I, I was just fascinated by the trade-offs involved and, um, you know, the, the incentives that go into decision-making. Mm -hmm. So, when I went back to grad school, uh, economics was a natural fit. Okay. So I went to the University of Colorado, Denver, mm -hmm. and I was working at the time, and I was able to take classes at night and get my master's degree there. And then you de like you decided that because of the influence of this professor, then were you taking his classes and then say, okay, there is a path here that I can still be in the business, but now in agriculture, and that's what led you to – you talk about the crisis, okay – can find a job. I don't know. I'm assuming yeah. here. Then you decided to go to grad school. How was how was that? Uh, well, I think the the agriculture piece came later, actually. Uh -huh. So uh, I I was familiar with that world from this professor that I had, but it wasn't the. That's not the area I wanted to do research in when I initially started my master's. That's. Cool. I was more interested in this financial crisis that we'd all just lived through and the causes and effects mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. So I was more kind of macro oriented, I think mm -hmm. at, oh. at, at the time. Um, but while I was looking for a thesis topic, I 
returned to ag Mm -hmm. and um, there was a lot of policy questions being discussed at the time. And I found that there was this, this whole world of ag policy that had really big, important um, economics questions Mm -hmm. at stake. And so uh, I stumbled kind of into this um, world of ag policy. And then I did a master's thesis on the federal crop insurance program. Cool. And that's what led you to go for a PhD. Like before, were have you had uh, any experience with research before? Or that was your master's was your first experience, and why continue to the PhD? Was the same thought for the master's, or okay, I'm doing this and I like it? I, I think it was it, it was just felt natural. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't done a ton of what you would call formal research. Yeah, but I'd wrote I'd written a uh, a, a semester long paper on the financial crisis that was happening because mm-hmm. I was I was actually overseas in the fall of 2008 doing a study abroad. Ooh, where were you? I was in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Cool. Yeah. How was it? Uh, it was awesome. It was great. I was, um, again, this was before I really got interested in um, ag econ or anything like that, but uh, it, the, it was a, a really cool cultural experience. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot about the history over there, and um, it, it was just probably the most enriching experience I had as an undergrad was that one semester overseas. I couldn't even tell you what I studied, to be honest. Most <laughs> of the time, the grades are pass-fail, because nobody remembers. So Actually, I, I had a health economics class. Oh, really? That's the one I do remember, um, which was super interesting. But what is interesting, everyone, we're getting off topic. Here now, I, know. Cool. <laughs> I know. I also uh, feel compelled to be like, I know not all courses in the EU are yeah. fast fail, but usually like when you travel, study abroad. Anyway, sorry. Everyone <laughs> that I've talked to that had the experience of studying abroad, they always like, wow, that was one of the best experiences that, I, that I've had in my life and everything. So how, how much do you recommend that? Uh, to- totally recommend it. Okay. If students have an opportunity, I tell my undergrads this all the time, if there's any opportunity that you have to do a study abroad, even if it's just a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. Like our program, uh, Department of Ag and Resource Economics, we do a, a, a semester-long trip to Italy. Oh, so cool. students can be over there studying mm-hmm. in Italy. Um, we also, uh, I believe we're looking at um, uh, the Toto Santos campus in mm-hmm. Mexico. Mm-hmm. There might be some opportunities there. That's and cool. um, I think there's some others. The college does a New Zealand trip that's coming yes. up. And most science does every spring. There is a New Zealand opportunity. They spend a semester there. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's nice. So going back to the master's and then you decided that you're going to go for a PhD and you went to Washington State, right? Yeah. Uh, so there was uh, a lot of ag policy work being done at Washington State mm-hmm. at the time. So uh, that attracted me there. Um, my wife was also interested in graduate school that's so cool. they had a, an English program that, that what she wanted to do. So that's how we ended up there and, uh, we loved it. It's awesome. Yeah. Perfect. And then you moved to more professional, right there? So, uh, moved to what? more professional career. Then. Oh yes. And that kind of, that was going to lead us to a sort of our yeah. next question. I was curious to know about what's it been like for you coming back to Colorado. And I know you have a unique story about, um, your advisor, uh, and then also uh, working here. So if you can help us fill in some of those blanks, we'd love sure. to hear about yeah. it. So while and I was at Washington state, my advisor was Haley Chenard, who is now the department head in my department in dare. Um, so while I was there, she took the job here. Mm hmm. I graduated in 18 and went to Purdue University as an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. In ag econ as well. In their ag econ department, yeah. That's awesome. Um, And and we stayed connected, and um, I also have uh, a a friend here in this department as well um, that I stayed connected with. And so when this position opened up in livestock economics with the ag next piece, Mm -hmm. they encouraged me to apply nice little shoulder tap hey you might want to look at this yeah <laughs> so it, it worked out that's great that's cool so what what it, what led you to like you just mentioned that somebody talked to you but can you just tell us what what did you do at purdue and what how it fits with the agnex well like okay mm-hmm. this is something that i wasn't looking for but it's here and now i'm i'm, I'm interested in applying 
can you just give like some background on what you used to do and how do you think it fits with the Agnex then? Sure. So I was a part of what's called a cluster hire at mm. Purdue, mm. which is what Agnex is. <laughs> You're also a cluster, cluster hire, hire here too. So, yeah. Uh, my own, my only experience has been as part of cluster hires. Uh, so that's interesting. Yeah, it is. It's um, kind of unique. So the cluster hire there was dedicated to digital agriculture okay. and precision agriculture, which is just the use of technology to manage ag resources at a fine scale and to optimize efficiency and reduce use resource usage. Mm -hmm. So I've, I did some research on um, the efficiency benefits of using ag tech for producers, as well as kind of the economics of data and farm mm -hmm. data, which is um, a line of research that I've continued here. But what interested me about ag next was that even though it was in a, a bit of a different the uh, sector of the ag economy. Mm -hmm. I'd been working in crops and yeah. of course Agnex is livestock, but the, uh, the opportunity to see how technology and data can improve uh, efficiency, reduce environmental impact of agriculture and, um, and kind of raise the profile of, of ag was attractive to me. That's cool. A anything specific that you worked on like ag, tech that you mentioned anything that you oh that 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 was a cool thing that we did there and it it can relate to sustainability like you said we do more livestock but sustainability on the crop side for example or mm -hmm. anything like that one of the things that we found which was um i think sort of obvious but the the benefits from if you implement you know variable rate application and you use some cloud-based software to to manage fields and you're using yield monitors, all these technologies mm -hmm. that are, um, that are, have grown in, in the cropping space. The, the benefits of those technologies are pretty small mm, Okay. and they're incremental. So if you, okay. mm. if you do one additional thing, it's not like your, uh, efficiency doubles or something like that, mm -hmm. or, or you're, all of a sudden, um, you're much more profitable. Yeah. There's small marginal changes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they um, they're cumulative. Okay, so it's like, like over ten years, or when you say that, when you say cumulative, what do you mean? Means like stacking different technologies. Oh, together. I understand. Yep, yeah. I see. I'm following. So you you might start with a base um, technology like yield monitor is pretty standard in mm, okay. in cropping, so you can see yield within the field at a thirty meter scale. Oh, That's interesting. And then on top of that, you might use GPS guidance or variable rate applications. Mm -hmm. And so those benefits are they're apparent when you stack multiple okay. technologies together. Their impact is smaller, but it's still additive. Something. Yeah. Like That's and then, oh, sorry, I have a question. Is it, <laughs> is your is the is the thing that you find interesting is that tension between if I add this kind of technology on farm what will my yield, will my yield increase in, or will my not necessarily yield, but like my, the economic aspects of my profit at the end of the year, is that what kind of draws you in that tension there? Or what, what, what do you find most interesting? I think what's most interesting is the, maybe the difference between advertised benefits and mm -hmm. actual experiences. Awesome. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Perfect. there's, it's easy to think that like there's this one silver bullet solution that's mm. going to make agriculture uh, it's going to eliminate its environmental impact and it's going to increase productivity and profitability. Where can I buy it? No, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I'm kidding. It, it, and we yep. get that question a lot, right, JR? Like on, on mm. our field, yeah. a silver bullet that's what, going to reduce. What's our silver reduce. bullet for mm. um, sustainability? Sustainability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But and these benefits. Turns out there's not a silver bullet, folks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I right. apologize. And there's always trade offs. Yes. Yes, there's always trade offs. I think you guys talked about the red seaweed. Uh huh. Yes. Application for yes. cattle feeding and the methane reductions that could mm -hmm. be associated with that. But you have to transport the stuff. Yes. Yeah. Well, and you have right. to grow it. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah. So and we're landlocked here in Colorado. So I'm not exactly sure where we would. But I know there's some folks that are, they're growing that stuff like in big grow tanks and stuff. I think maybe yeah. in New Zealand. Um, cool. Don't don't quote me. Yeah. yeah. Plus so. the trade-offs, potential trade-offs in production or other mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. That's That's cool. And Another thing is the stacking technology. I mean, we know that technology X can improve production or reduce gas by X percent and 10 percent, let's say. And this other one, 10 percent as well. If I add them together, 
it's going to be, let's say, 20%, but that's not always the case, right? Yep. And that's probably the same in crops. If using this technology improves your yield 10% and this other 10%, so if you have 10 of those technologies, are going to double production technically. Yeah, and it might be that the mean of that distribution is um, some positive effect. Yeah. But the variance, I mean, there's so much experience around it that could, for some producers, it might be negative. Mm-hmm. Um, and some it might be much greater and in everything in between. So it's it's hard to say there's a one-size-fits-all solution to mm-hmm. be it sustainability or efficiency or mm-hmm. anything like that. Well, because of things like regional variability and, you know, what's available to you. There's a there's a ton of reasons why that, that happens, I imagine. Right. Yeah, exactly. Depends. It de- that's it depends. always every time I talk to an economist, it always depends. Yeah, it de- it depends. No, that awesome. that's good. So you talk a little bit about how that transition at Purdue and you coming to Colorado. Can you just start telling when did you start with Ag Next and why you come to to CSU, for example? Yeah, so I started here in August of 2022. Mm-hmm. So about at the year and a half mark. And, um, that seems like it went fast. It did. Does yeah. it feel fast? <laughs> it does. Okay, I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, it's been it's been great coming back to the Front Range. Um, I thought I'd travel down to Denver a lot more, but Fort Collins is um, it kind of has everything you need, so mm-hmm. we're pretty happy to stay close to home. Um, so since the transition here to Act Next, I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit about different grants and projects that you're working on, stuff you're excited about. Sure. Well, one of the um, things that we're really excited about is um, we won a grant through the NRCS called uh, the Conservation Innovation Grant. Oh, yeah, SIG. Mm-hmm, that's a good one. Uh, and we submitted that pretty early on when I got here, and um, we we recently just started it. And that was to the tune of how many dollars? Uh, it's a million, a little over a million federal. And then <laughs> exactly. we're uh, putting up about a million in match. We're very match excited matches. about that victory, That's folks. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So um, the the grant is built in, in kind of stages. And the first stage is uh, some enteric methane emissions research mm-hmm. that the, um, the, the animal science folks are doing. So... That involves grazing cattle at different origins mm-hmm. uh, around the kind of the Western Plains mm-hmm. and then taking those cattle from those different origins, putting them in a causing common grazing setting. Mm-hmm. And throughout this whole process, we're measuring methane emissions from mm-hmm. these cattle, then taking them after that common grazing stage into a feedlot setting and mm-hmm. measuring emissions there and trying some different things to see what could potentially reduce methane emissions mm-hmm. in in those different settings. Kind of across the beef life cycle. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. Getting a picture of uh, the enteric methane output of cattle from sort of the beginning of the supply chain through the finishing stage, Okay, mm-hmm. uh, which is really exciting. Which I feel like that hasn't been done before, right? That's novel. I think is so. Is it? Just kind of yeah. like following, yeah. that, uh, following animals that way through the life cycle, spe- right? Especially bringing animals from different places, put them all together in the common diet, then even transition that diet and look at that. That's, I mean, there are a lot of questions right now, and I think this is one of the ones uh, that, that we are trying to answer. So that's that's a pretty... Is that pretty one a five-year project? Five year it's project? actually three. Three, it's, okay. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a fairly, uh, it's a relatively short um, period to do this in. Okay. And the, the second piece is where um, the econo- economics is coming in, and that's where we're going to do some experiments to see what would cow-calf producers or feedlot managers be willing to do to actually produce the kinds of methane reductions mm-hmm. that policymakers uh, would like to see. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this uh, involves... Um, like a survey? It or? involves survey work okay. and a, a specific type of survey mm-hmm. work called choice experiments. Oh, uh-huh. interesting. Okay. So when you don't have a market that you can go observe prices readily mm-hmm. or quantity output or things like that, when there's new things on the horizon that you that you haven't experienced before, you kind of create these hypothetical scenarios. Mm-hmm. And you, in our case, will be offering producers contracts, hypothetical contracts. Oh, interesting. That mimic a kind of a carbon program. See. So it would say you're, you would 
implement some kind of rotational grazing with a virtual fencing. Um, Maybe like an additive or something. Too, yeah, or, or, or in whatever. the feedlot setting, like an mm-hmm. additive. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are going to come with costs. Yes. And and then the, the contract would offer some sort of reimbursement or payment. Mm-hmm. And then we observe what do producers actually pick when they're given a, a menu of choices. Mm-hmm. I see. That way. And do mm-hmm. you have any hypothesis on that? I mean, have you... St- I don't think you have you started that or not yet. Not yet. And do you have any hypothesis on that? Like, how do you see the future market on this field, for example? I think the the feedback that I've seen from producers. Uh, this is I'm talking more about the crop space now, mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the kind of carbon sequestration programs that mm-hmm. are out there that are a little further along. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the feedback I've seen is that the prices tend to be too low. Mm-hmm. And the benefits are um, are uncertain. Mm-hmm. I see. So we're in the in like midwestern cropping mm-hmm. space, it's a lot of payments for no till or mm-hmm. cover crop mm-hmm. impl- implementation. And how is the feedback when there is a production benefit on that? Do you think that they? It's a oh, different. Does that like change their perspective on interest in like, using it, or is it easier to implement, or like? Do you think it develop a new technology? Let's say in this carbon market, what is the best approach? Is something that enhances production, or if the carbon market actually pays, they would do that? Like, is there any? Do you have an answer for that? I'm just I don't, curious. I don't know that I have. I a, have a guess. It a depends. Guess. <laughs> <laughs> it depends, it, and it does. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> so the that's kind of what we we're trying to get at with this grant is. Um, we want to understand, okay, if you're going to require a feedlot to use some sort of feed additive that could potentially reduce enteric methane by 30%, let's say, uh-huh. mm-hmm. um, and that additive has costs X dollars mm-hmm. per head. Um, per day. Per day. Then we need to understand what is that metric ton of CO2 equivalent that they're reducing mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. 30% worth in the marketplace that is going to compensate the X dollar increase for the additive and mm-hmm. the additional cost of potentially changing your, the, the way in which you feed cattle mm-hmm. and um, how you source the, the additive mm-hmm. and, yeah. and all of these Availability trade-offs. and a bunch of stuff. Yeah. 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 And is that benefit linear? Does it, is it 30% all the, the entire time they're in the feedlot? Does it I taper see. off? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of those things we don't really know. Job mm-hmm. security. Yeah, that, I mean, <laughs> some days, yeah, that's true. Um, I was going to ask a question. It's it's along the lines of what we've been talking about, but it's. Um, I'm curious how much this comes up in your conversations with producers and their hesitancy to try new technology. Yeah. Um, it, do you find that some folks are like, no, my, my grandparents did it this way and their great-grandparents did it this way and this is just how we farm here and we are not interested in doing anything else? Do you ever run into that? or The, the best th- way I've heard it explained to me was, if you're a crop producer, and it's true of cow calf producers yeah. too, in your career as a producer, mm-hmm. you'll have 40, 50 crops. Oh, 40, right. 40, 50 calf crops, 40, 50 mm-hmm. um, Thinking harvests. about the human life cycle. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh-huh. that's and if you're going to do uh, something that is a dramatic departure from the way that you've done it and that you're family has mm-hmm. done it for generations. This is especially true in cow calf production, mm-hmm. wh- which is very much tied to the traditional way people homesteaded in the West. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, you know, you have this very limited number of opportunities to produce a crop. Mm-hmm. And so it, it takes not only the, the financial incentives to make that pencil out, but also the, the cultural and the social, mm-hmm. um, you know, commitments that people have are, you know, they're not Very strong. easy to, to give up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So even things like RFID tags, mm-hmm. yeah. that can be 
Some folks do not want to use that technology on their herds. Right. They are not interested in that. Yep. But there's other people that are, but that's, sure. yeah, I was just kind of curious because I know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, I was just kind of curious based mm-hmm. on your expertise, how that shows up in your work. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, we, we've spent a lot of time and I, and I, <laughs> I like know we've these. kind of gone through some of these questions already as yeah, we've been going along. Yeah, and you mentioned along. like, is there any other project that you've involved? You mentioned about your sea grant, but what, what else? Are you planning to do here at Tagnex in let's say the next five years? So um, I've been working on uh, some climate adaptation stuff in the mm-hmm. in the beef industry. So um, what I've been kind of interested in is the the way that the cow calf sector mm-hmm. has adapted to a, a drier, warmer climate, Mm-hmm. and how that's different from other sectors like the finishing stage mm-hmm. of the supply chain and how that's different from processing. So if you look at the average herd size in the United States, mm-hmm. it really hasn't budged. It's about 40 head yeah. per operation, mm-hmm. and it hasn't changed. Which a lot of people don't know that, right? Yeah, when yeah it's usually smaller. It's yeah. yeah. When you tell people the average 40 head, they wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's not the, the kind of... That's average. <laughs> that's the average. Yeah, so there's the plenty average, on the yeah. left side of that number. And both yeah. ways, probably. You know, yeah, I know yeah. there's a, there's somebody in Longmont that has like three animals in their backyard in town. I love them. They have like three yeah. three cattle or three cows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. So the, the every everything else in agriculture we associate with consolidation in the last hundred years. You look at the dairy industry, the, mm-hmm. the average herd side, average herd size has exploded mm-hmm. and the number of operations has shrunk. Mm-hmm. Um, swine, pig operations, they're kind of across yeah. the board, yeah. much fewer, but they're huge operations. Mm-hmm. A lot of that has to do with scale economies and uh, the feedlot sector. The feedlot sector, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the cow-calf, also, I think the has, cow-calf is different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that has allowed, though, for some room and efficiencies, right? So, like, I know there's a lot, we're producing a lot more food with less animals now than we had been in mm-hmm. the past. Right. Um, so, I think that's important to know yeah. when we're talking about that consolidation as well. Oh, yeah, consolidation, exactly. it's yeah. a good thing in, when we, in, in those industries. I think it's, for the production standpoint, it, it was a great thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but again, their trade-offs are mm-hmm. yep. mm-hmm. involved with that, too, because the, the rural communities that those so, you know, before a hundred oh, yeah. um, dairies or a hundred hog farms so what happened? became one mm-hmm. that's highly efficient and it produces a lot of benefits for consumers. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are, but what, what happens to the rural community vibrancy? What happens to those rural farms? Do they switch to other crops? I know my family, whenever we closed down our dairy, we switched full time to beef at that point mm-hmm. um, that we had been beef and dairy and hogs at some point, but um, then we switched fully to, to beef ranching. Mm-hmm. And and what, what do you think is going to happen with the beef industry? It's going to stay the same, the cow calf especially, right? So that's one of the things that I'm really interested in is is how does that piece of the supply chain, um, how do they respond to persistent drought? Mm-hmm. So I've collected um, data going back to the 70s and the USDA's Census of Ag reports how many operations and how much inventory uh, is in the United States by different herd size classes. Mm -hmm. Mm, So now you can see not just the average herd size, you can see the distribution of farms and Mm. animals uh, among operations that have one to nine head, you know, 10 to 20, all the Mm -hmm. way up to Mm -hmm. the 500 plus category. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you can, and what I want to do is see how those, uh, the distribution of, animals and farms across those classes change mm-hmm. when there's drought. I see. Oh, so. interesting. Are you doing any regional shifts in that too, or is it mostly just herd sizes? It's mostly l- like within the same county. Oh, so okay. I've got mm-hmm. I see. By county. Oh, that's cool. So you can is that see. from USDA? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that's what you said. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, that's a project I'm excited about and finding some, some things that actually surprised me, some results that I wasn't expecting. Uh, so I'm I'm writing that paper up right now. Oh, cool! And then um, we've also got some work on virtual fencing. That's cool. And um, that's definitely in the new tech world, right? I mean, how long yeah. has that stuff been around? Well, apparently it's 
It's been around, it's been around a lot for longer a while. than I thought. It, it seems Jordan Beaton was in grad school. <laughs> oh, Lord, I mean, that's how long that's been. <laughs> yeah, John's been working <laughs> on this. <laughs> He's been writing about it for a while. I'm I just I feel like we see it a work. lot more in the media now. I think I wonder if it's just, as with any technology, it becomes more accessible over time, right? The prices go down a little bit. Like, people can actually afford to access it. I, I'm just kind of curious about that. But I, Yeah, that was also true in... Um, with precision agriculture, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. of those technologies, like the yield monitor, yeah, was released in like 1992. Okay, um, but it took a while before mm-hmm. uh, the public saw it as maybe the ha- having the potential that it has. I'm yeah. curious to ask a question. In your opinion, do you think we'll see the same thing with methane reduction technology? I don't know. So for for one thing. Um, I don't know what the the technologies are going to look like. Mm-hmm. Are they going to be additives yeah. primarily, or are they going to be uh, feeding strategies that mm-hmm. keep, you know, that minimize the amount of time that the animals on feed? Mm-hmm. And if you can shorten that period of time from getting into the feedlot into the processor, that's so many days shorter mm-hmm. that they're emitting mm-hmm. methane. Yep. So is it? efficiency just efficiency strategies to Mm -hmm. reduce that footprint Mm -hmm. or is it on the feet you know on the additive is it implants Mm -hmm. i don't again we're going back to there's no silver bullet so (laughs) a lot of stuff to look at yeah Uh, yeah what one last i don't know i'm saying last but we may come up (laughs) with more questions on that is you mentioned you used to work more in the crop side and that on livestock side any major difference in the producer aspect or do you because the I think the crops so dynamic, in in my opinion. But like, do you see that? Are there big differences or big things that you see in common between the two two industries? Yeah, good question. I think the 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 similarities are you still have um, somebody that has to produce a crop, be it a mm-hmm. calf crop or a harvest. Mm-hmm. and they want to do that with as few resources as possible and, you know, be good stewards of the land mm-hmm. throughout mm-hmm. the whole process. Mm-hmm. So I think there's the fundamentals mm-hmm. are really the same there. Cool. The details might be a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, like I, I mentioned, the we were talking about the cow-calf sector has not seen the kind of consolidation that mm-hmm. other parts of the ag economy have. Mm-hmm. Crop production, the producers have experienced that kind of consolidation. Oh, Average farm size has grown mm-hmm. significantly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's there's economic explanations for that. You know, with crop production, if you have a combine, you know, the, the per unit cost of running that combine goes down the more acreage mm-hmm. that you have. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, that, that fixed cost gets spread over more Mm-hmm. production mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so some of this is just kind of economics explains that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and there's also um land issues mm-hmm. you know, the the value mm-hmm. of farmland um has has just risen dramatically it in the has, last few years it's really like gone through the roof yeah you hear stories about land going for over twenty thousand dollars an acre oh yeah mm-hmm. and i feel like i just saw something was it in iowa or some illinois maybe it was like yeah. hunt like that like a lot of money per acre. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I teach a, a, a nag finance class and we talk a lot about the eighties farm crisis. Mm-hmm. And, um, there are some, some kind of parallels now to mm, that period of time. And there's a lot of differences too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you look at debt to asset ratios, the farm sector actually looks pretty good mm. because asset values are high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but aggregate debt yep. and interest rates yep. are creating huge pressures mm-hmm. on farmers right now. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. Yeah. And cost of fuel and it's gone down a little bit, but there's all these e- inflation across the farm, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You can feel it everywhere. So you just talked a little bit about your class. So I was curious if we could segue because <laughs> I want to know more about that. Um, so you, part of your part of your um, role here at Ag Next and in Dare is that you uh, have a teaching appointment. So can you tell us about besides the finance class you're teaching? Tell us about what other classes you're teaching, and then we'd also love to hear about the livestock um, business management major. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So my main class right now is Ag Finance. I I may have another Ag Biz class. 
um, that I teach depending on what the department needs. But um, I, I love teaching undergrads and um, the class that I teach is like a senior level course. So it's fun to teach at that level as, as students are kind of looking ahead to their careers. A little more polished than maybe when they first arrive on campus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at Purdue, Only wearing sweatpants one day a week. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. I'm, joking. I'm joking. When I was at Purdue, I taught a freshman intro microeconomics class, which had yeah. like 160 students in it. And that was fun for different reasons. But uh-huh. it's, I, I enjoy teaching a little smaller class size um, with some, I think, real world application that the students can use. Um so the, the Livestock Business Management Program is a brand new major in DARE, and it's a partnership with Animal Sciences. Mm-hmm. So this, this came out of uh, discussions with industry folks about what do they want to see from undergrads coming out of school that they would like to hire. And the, the feedback was, well, we want more face-to-face interaction with these students mm-hmm. while they're students, and we want to yep. put them on real-world problems that they can tackle and um, and kind of get that experience while they're in school. Mm-hmm. That's cool. So and, and having familiarity with the livestock industry and that is, that exposure is really was really valuable to them. Oh, that's great. And that's that's brand new, right? It's brand new. Yeah, our first students uh, have just started this fall. Oh wow! Yeah. How many going? folks do you have? Do you I have think there's twelve undergrads. Oh, enrolled, that's awesome. Which is great for a brand new major. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah, that's cool. Awesome. What. Uh, one thing that our like we, we bring people here me talk about the pillars of sustainability like economic, social and environmental. How do you see like your work and especially your economic work fits in, in sustainability today? Like we've we've circled around that here, but mm-hmm. is there anything specific that you, you think about? We forgot to ask him what is your definition about sustainability. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Oops. Yeah, uh, that's usually our. We've been having for, such good conversations. I I'm forgetting to ask the actual <laughs> uh, questions. I'm sorry. And uh, we, we, I like to ask people that. What is your uh, definition about sustainability? And let's see now, how do you see your piece of work fitting in that maybe in that pillar like economic, social, and environmental? Uh, I think of sustainability as is being able to to feed the world with as little mm-hmm. resources as possible mm-hmm. and as small an environmental footprint as possible and being able to do that into the future so that the next generation can mm-hmm. do the same thing. Um, and economics is, uh, is pivotal because I- economics, we, th- we think a lot about incentives and trade-offs. Mm-hmm. So if you show somebody the incentives of a system or a program, they'll know what the outcome is. Mm. You know, tell me the incentives and I'll tell you the outcome. Mm-hmm. So if you have um, a market or a program where incentives are to not conserve resources mm-hmm. and waste them, then you're going to have that outcome. That's, that's just, yeah. you know, people uh, are, are going to follow those incentives. And trade-offs are important to understand because if you have a policy that is trying to create, correct some market failure, or improve sustainability in some mm-hmm. way. Uh, you have to know what the knock-on effects are mm-hmm. and um, be able to uh, in, you know, incentivize people to do the thing that you're trying to get them to do. Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, those folks still need to make money to like feed their families, yeah. right? That's, yeah. the, that's the big part of this conversation too. Not that it's the sole driver. I don't know that folks get into agriculture to make money, or at least people that I know that wasn't necessarily why they got into it because they care about it, but also they do have real bills and mortgages and farm yeah. payments and mm-hmm. tractor payments and just stuff they have to make. And so it is an important part of that. I imagine it is. Yeah. And, and rural communities depend on agriculture to be profitable and mm-hmm. to be sustainable economically Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what happens if that if that all leaves that small town, right? Mm-hmm. How do you how do you navigate that? Yep, exactly. That's cool. So now, are we good? Can we go to the career? Yeah, life questions I was going to see if you wanted to ask that next one. Uh, so career questions. Yes. Now we go. <laughs> that's a question that I I also always like to ask is uh, looking back in your career, you finished school. What, almost 15, 14, 13 years ago? See, I, I finished my master's in December of 2013. 
So 10 years so ago. Exactly 10 years ago. And that's the question. Up. <laughs> what, what is what is something that you know today that you wish you knew 10 years ago oh so or it's would you tell question. yourself hey young nate <laughs> um, pre-dr nate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think i would tell myself that um academia is more than just writing papers <laughs> Which seems sort of obvious, <laughs> but especially it, meetings, right? Uh, oh man, yeah. I, I love me I love meetings. I love teams. Meetings. As a student, that's kind of what you're focused on is yeah. writing your thesis or mm -hmm. being a research assistant for somebody. Mm -hmm. and, um, but academia is a lot more than that, and um, so understand that there are there's a lot of good that comes with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So be, be open to that, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, That's cool. The trade-offs and the, uh, understand <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, the trade-offs <laughs> trade and the incentives. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. I also didn't have kids 10 years ago, so I'm, I'm kind oh, of imagining a totally different person. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. So our next one is about mentorship. So I'm kind of curious about, you know, what has mentorship done for you in your career? Um, and how do you seek that out in this role? Yeah, well, mentorship is huge. Uh, I benefited from it greatly. I mean, part of my being here, well, a big part of my being here mm -hmm. is because I had great mentors. I had great advisors um, and, and people that were willing to invest in in me. Mm -hmm. So I hope to pass that on. Um, you know, we, as the land, the land grant mission, part of that is, is mentoring students, but also um, our, you know, colleagues that are coming up behind us. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, it's interesting, like in your case, specifically one of your mentors, you like, I'm not saying the reason you were here, it's it's because, of course, your mentors guide you, but you stayed in touch with probably one of your mentors, maybe open you the eye to come come back here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it was very true in my case that good mentorship led to a really good career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've only had good experiences in academia with that. And I know people have their, mm -hmm. you know, experiences vary. Mine's been... Mm -hmm. 100% good. That's awesome. And what is something that you think you did to have that good experience? Because, I mean, a lot of times is, of course, there's the mentor, but the person who is seeking for mentorship, or you, in my case, I remember like one of my mentors, I think when I was an undergrad, people would tell bad things about the person. And then I said, okay, I'm going to start to work with this person, but I'm going to go blind it. I would try to go fresh and learn mm -hmm. without any pre-judgment. Yeah. Like, is there something that you think you did? Like you say, okay, that helped me doing that. Or I work really hard every day. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I think just understanding that um, as a student, as a grad student, that as the sort of mentor mentee relationship, it's, First and foremost, it's a professional relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to that's be important. doing what you're that's expected. That's important. Some people don't know that, though. <laughs> they, yeah, that's good. Good clarifier. You have to meet expectations, work hard, and do what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And that can become, uh, it can become friendship, and it can, mm -hmm. it can become, you know, a, a really great lifelong relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's been my experience. But it starts as a professional relationship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you are willing to work hard and do what you're supposed to do, um, then that you will get a lot more out of your mentorship. Yeah. Right. Uh, like Terry Yang always says, show up, work hard, and be nice. Yeah. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like he always says that. Yeah. And every day you talk to him, how, how's it going? Another day in paradise. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's always what he says. So besides work, Nate, uh, w we know that you like, to bike and, and do other things like that. How did that come up for you? Like you've always done that? Is something that you use as a hobby or whatever? You, we've we were talking before here and you mentioned that you really like to bike. Is there anything else or how the bicycle came to came to So your I actually, I didn't start biking until I moved back to Colorado. Uh -huh. um, and uh, 
because it's such a bike friendly town, I started commuting to work on a bike. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm a, I'm a biker in so far as that goes. I just yeah. go, go to work. You're like, let me work. clarify. I'm not one of those long <laughs> distance, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got a 90s mountain bike off of Craigslist. That's awesome. Uh-huh. That's been perfect. Um, oh, that's great. And that's it's something as a family we like to do. Um, we got bikes for everybody and oh, cool. a trailer. And, and yeah, we, we love it. But we're not intense about it oh yeah that's cool like diego if they're running right oh yeah some right not like (laughs) very intense on their activities um well and speaking of your family i know we were you were answering the question earlier you said oh well before then i didn't have kids and so Mm -hmm. tell us about your family we'd love to hear about your kiddos and your wife sure so uh i've been married since 2011 awesome uh so we got married just right out of college and um we you know lived in Denver for a while, went to grad school together. So mm-hmm. we've, um, we've kind of done, uh, my whole academic career has been with her. So oh, that's she, cool. You know, any mm-hmm. success that I've ever had is because of that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And if um, you're, if your wife's not listening, rewind. I'm, listening <laughs> <again. laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and then I have three kids. Uh, my oldest is Walter. He just turned seven. Middle is Amelia. She's four. And our youngest Madeline is two. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Does she ride in the bike trailer? Yeah. Okay. That's so we've cool. got the trailer and then we also have a seat that's on my bike. Uh-huh. So my youngest will usually ride on that. That's pretty that's cool. awesome. Yeah. And I bet that changed your perception a little bit too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's great. Uh, so that's awesome. Uh, on that now is, is the time that we, again, uh, final quick questions, I would say. Mm-hmm. So what is... Uh, I mean, what is a bo- good book that you have read recently, or it can mm-hmm. be a book that you you like to visit once in a while that you would like to recommend to our listeners? So uh, I'll tell you about the, the book I'm reading right now is uh, a book by David Stockman called The Triumph of Politics. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And it's about uh, Ronald Reagan's budget director in the 80s interesting. and his experience passing uh, in, involved in passing a budget and tax policy in those oh wow early years of the Reagan administration mm-hmm. oh wow and it's a it's just a kind of a glimpse into the world of politics and budget and and as somebody that's kind of interested in policy it's mm-hmm. I'm, I'm really enjoying it yeah, I was like I wasn't expecting that answer in the fun category but I'm glad it's there <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> yeah that's great that's good uh awesome. now uh what is your favorite food Ooh, yeah, this oh, yeah, this is a good one. Okay, I know um, probably the hardest question of the day. Yes, I like I like spicy food. Oh, um, I like Cajun food a lot. Ooh, okay. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we went to my wife and I went to New Orleans as a honeymoon thing. Oh, cool. Uh-huh. And we only spent money on food. We just budgeted. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like mm-hmm. 100 bucks a day Priorities. just for food. And, good. Uh, and that's when I discovered Cajun food. It was like anything, if it's hole in the wall bar mm-hmm. would be amazing, all the way to a super upscale oh, yeah. nice place. And New Orleans so, does yeah. have good food. Yeah. Do you really like does, really yeah. spicy food? Yeah. yeah. Oh wow! I can't handle that's that. That's amazing. No. I s- there's a new hot chicken place in oh, town that I just Dave's tried yesterday. Try it. Did you try it? Yeah, it's amazing. It is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I just had the hot. And there's oh. two levels up. So mm-hmm. th- there's one you actually had to sign a waiver for. Yeah. Oh, really? The the hottest level, there's like a waiver you have to sign Gee. to yeah. eat it. Yeah. I was I like, guess. maybe that's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and then the last one is you talk about your study abroad and, and things. What is what is the nicest place that you ever visit? Or um, I think Edinburgh, Scotland uh-huh. oh, cool. is my f- favorite place I've ever been, which was... I went there as a part of that study abroad mm-hmm. and um after having kids i haven't been able to go overseas <laughs> much but uh ho- looking forward to doing that again someday but yeah edinburgh was amazing that's awesome it yeah. was during it was while the financial crisis was happening mm-hmm. and the famous economist adam smith yeah mm-hmm. was was there and the when he was writing the wealth of nations so there's some stuff some history there with him which was oh, really cool that's cool yeah that's nice that's pretty cool yeah 
Awesome. Cool. I'm well, done there. Yeah. Cool. Oh, no, that's okay. That's great. Um, well, Nate, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. We appreciate you. having you. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for tuning in as well. Um, just as always, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Agnex podcast. Um, we always encourage folks to um, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, if you have any comments, suggestions, or feedback, we would love to hear from you. Um, you can just email us at agnext at colostate.edu or visit us at agnext.colostate.edu. Um, and thanks for tuning in for another yeah. episode of Ag Next. Yeah. Um, Thank podcast. you, Nate. Thank you both. Awesome. Thanks. thanks.